In this podcast episode, Andrew Huberman interviews Dr. Karen Parker, who directs the Social Neurosciences Research Program at the Stanford University School of Medicine. The focus of her research is to understand the biological basis of social functioning at every stage of the lifespan, with a heavy emphasis on autism and autism spectrum disorders. One of the key topics of discussion is the increase in the incidence of autism. Dr. Parker explains that while the diagnosis of autism has improved over the years, the actual incidence of autism has also dramatically increased. She attributes this to better detection methods and increased awareness, as well as the fact that autism is highly heritable, with about 40 to 80% of autism being genetic. The discussion also touches on the male bias in autism prevalence, with about three to four boys being impacted for every one girl. The conversation then delves into the diagnostic tools used for autism, which are primarily behavioral in nature. Dr. Parker explains that clinicians look for pervasive social interaction challenges and the presence of restricted repetitive behavior in order to diagnose autism. She also discusses the challenges of early behavioral interventions and the need for genetically defined subgroups of individuals to better understand and treat autism. The discussion then shifts to the role of the environment in autism. Dr. Parker highlights various environmental influences such as advanced parental age, prematurity, and maternal illness during pregnancy that have been associated with an increased risk for autism. However, she emphasizes the difficulty of studying environmental risk factors due to the genetic heterogeneity of autism. The conversation then turns to the biological basis of social behavior and communication, with a focus on the neuropeptides oxytocin and vasopressin. Dr. Parker explains that these ancient peptides, which are highly evolutionarily conserved, are involved in social behavior across various species. She also discusses their physiological roles, with oxytocin being involved in uterine contractions and milk letdown, and vasopressin being involved in urine regulation and blood pressure. The discussion then delves into the potential use of oxytocin in treating autism. Dr. Parker explains that while oxytocin has shown promise in improving social functioning in individuals with autism, there are still many unanswered questions about its effectiveness and safety. She highlights the need for further research to identify specific subpopulations of individuals with autism who may benefit from oxytocin treatment. One of the key findings discussed in the podcast is the relationship between baseline levels of oxytocin and the response to oxytocin treatment. Dr. Parker explains that individuals with lower baseline levels of oxytocin showed greater benefit from oxytocin intervention, suggesting that there may be a subset of individuals with autism who have an oxytocin deficiency. However, she emphasizes the need for rigorous clinical trials to determine the safety and efficacy of oxytocin treatment in children with autism. The conversation also touches on the challenges of diagnosing and treating autism, including long clinic wait times and the need for early intervention. Dr. Parker discusses the potential for laboratory-based tests to identify biomarkers for autism, which could help prioritize early diagnosis and intervention for at-risk children. Furthermore, the podcast explores the heterogeneity of autism and the importance of considering age and developmental stage in the assessment of oxytocin treatment. Dr. Parker mentions a study suggesting that oxytocin may be most effective in younger children, highlighting the need for age-specific approaches to treatment. The podcast delves into the challenges of diagnosing autism and the limitations of current clinical methods. Dr. Parker highlights the need for more efficient and accessible diagnostic tools, especially in underserved communities where access to resources is limited. She emphasizes the importance of prioritizing early diagnosis and intervention for children with autism to ensure timely support and treatment. One of the key barriers to widespread behavioral testing for autism is the time and expertise required for accurate diagnosis. Dr. Parker explains that traditional clinical methods can be time-consuming and may not be scalable to meet the growing demand for autism diagnosis. She also discusses the potential for using video clips or other innovative methods to streamline the diagnostic process and prioritize individuals in need of timely intervention. The conversation then shifts to the potential use of MDMA and vasopressin 
in the treatment of autism. Dr. Parker acknowledges the ongoing trials exploring the use of MDMA and vasopressin for autism treatment and highlights the need for further research in this area. She also discusses the challenges of conducting human trials and the ethical considerations involved in testing new treatments for autism. Dr. Parker's research on vasopressin and its role in social behavior is a major focus of the podcast. She explains that vasopressin, a neuropeptide chemically similar to oxytocin, is produced in the human brain and body. She discusses her work in developing a primate model for autism using rhesus macaques and the validation of behavioral phenotypes related to social impairments. Dr. Parker continues by discussing her work with primates at the Regional Primate Center, where she identified monkeys with low social affiliative behavior, which resembled features of human autism. She then conducted a biomarker discovery study to measure neurotransmitter systems in these monkeys and found that cerebral spinal fluid levels of vasopressin were a key driver in classifying low and high social monkeys with 93% accuracy. This finding led her to investigate the potential translational value of vasopressin in humans, particularly in children with autism. To study the role of vasopressin in children with autism, Dr. Parker and her team collected cerebral spinal fluid samples from children with and without autism. They found that children with autism had lower levels of vasopressin in their spinal fluid, which correlated with greater social symptom severity. This discovery led to a first-of-its-kind clinical trial where children with autism were given vasopressin treatment. The results showed that children who received vasopressin demonstrated improvements in social abilities, as reported by parents, clinicians, and through laboratory-based tests. Dr. Parker also discusses the potential implications of her research, including the need for further studies to understand the mechanisms of vasopressin in the brain and its potential for early intervention in children with autism. She highlights the importance of replicating the findings in larger samples and exploring alternative therapies that may modulate vasopressin levels. In addition to her research on vasopressin, Dr. Parker addresses the broader implications of her work, including the potential for personalized medicine and the need for interdisciplinary collaboration to advance our understanding of autism and related neurodevelopmental disorders. She emphasizes the importance of considering individual differences in response to treatment and the need for rigorous clinical trials to evaluate the safety and efficacy of potential interventions. The conversation also touches on the challenges of conducting research in the field of autism, including the lack of funding for high-risk and novel approaches. Dr. Parker emphasizes the importance of evidence-based research and the need for open dialogue with parent stakeholders to address the complex issues surrounding autism. The discussion also addresses the controversial topic of vaccines and autism. Dr. Huberman and Dr. Parker explore the history of the vaccine autism debate, highlighting the impact of a fraudulent study that led to widespread fear and misinformation. They discuss the importance of evidence-based research and the need to address the concerns of parents while dispelling myths and misinformation about vaccines and autism.